Would you pray with me after that song? That's just, I think, such a, a truth that our hearts need to cry out each and every day. Let's pray. Father God, as we'll see in this text today, Lord, when we call, you answer. Lord, you indeed have come to our rescue through your son, Jesus. Now, Lord, we we live with the eternal hope that we will be where you are for eternity one day. God, I pray that we would long to have the intimacy with you each and every day, or that we realize that you are here with us through your Holy Spirit. And I pray earnestly that we would seek your will in our lives, that we would surrender. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If y'all will turn with me to Jonah chapter 2. Really, we're going to start in Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. Uh, But while you're turning there, I want to kind of catch us up from last week and uh, set the stage for what we're about to read. Jonah is called by God to go call out against the Ninevites. This is summary, so I'm not going to go real in-depth on this. Jonah says, no way. And then he attempts to go 3,000 plus miles in the opposite direction. Jonah is on a ship. God hurls a storm on the sea. The sailors on the ship are wigging out. Jonah is taking a nap in the bottom of the boat. They wake him up and they say, what are you doing? We're trying to call on our gods. Nothing's happening. How about you call on your God? And maybe this will all end. Let's just give it a shot. But instead of Jonah praying, he seems perfectly content to let the sailors continue to call on their gods and cast lots. There's a proverb Proverbs 16.33 that says the lot is cast into the lap, but its very decision is from the Lord. So if anybody had any doubt, these pagan sailors who were relying upon lots to be cast and Jonah just going along with them, if they have any doubt, guess what happens? The lot falls on who? That's a question. The lot falls on Jonah. They're trusting the lots... I guess Jonah is as well. And then they look at him and they say, what? Who are you? Who is your God? Can you get us out of this mess? Essentially. And Jonah says, I serve Yahweh, the one true and living God. He never answers what his occupation is. And he seems perfectly content at that point to say, look, if you want this mess to end, just throw me overboard. But it's amazing that The men, the sailors on the ship, as soon as they find out who Jonah serves, they call out to Jonah's God. Why? Because they immediately have seen that if your God is strong enough to cause this storm and our gods that we're praying to can't do anything about it, we'll go with your God. The one who caused it, maybe he can stop it. But Jonah says, throw me overboard. The men say, no, let's try to row back. And they finally give up and throw them overboard and ask for God not to kill them, essentially. And that's where we wind up in verse 17. The text says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord, and out of my distress, he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again. Look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you 
brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Now, that last verse is just a little too much detail for me. I could have gone without the word vomit, but the translators here went with it. This part of Jonah's story is bookended by a great fish being commanded by God, appointed and spoken to, to do something. Now, when we look at the prayer, we see that Jonah is praying out of a distress But his distress is not from being in the belly of the fish. Which, mind you, if I can give you a little um, nerd moment, this is nothing. Like I told the first service, it does nothing for your sanctification. You just got to follow me. In my nerd research, I got to thinking, if a fish swallowed a human being, it must be pretty big. How big was the fish? So then I go to Google, the best search engine out there, right? And what do I type? How big was the fish that swallowed Jonah? I'm just curious. Right? Most of my outline was already done. So I look, and I discover something. The biggest fish that we know today, there's like two of them. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Feel free. The blue whale and the whale shark. Right? They're ginormous. They're huge. But even those two fish that are about 39 to 50 feet long cannot swallow a human being whole. Here's why. I'm going somewhere with this, trust me. When a whale takes a prey in its mouth, it crushes it against the roof of its mouth with its tongue. Problem number one. If it were a whale, Jonah would not have survived long enough to get through to the belly, right? Number two. The back of the throat of the whale is not big enough for Jonah or any human being, to fit through. So, if a fish swallowed Jonah, this thing had to be like, I don't know. I don't have a size, just ginormous. So, Nikki, Michael, and myself talked about it this week. This is what happens uh, at the end of staff meetings. And we decided that we're just going to call this thing the Jonah fish. I probably said that it's very possible, I have nothing to back this up, but it's very possible that God just created the fish to swallow Jonah and to transport him safely to dry land and then vomited it up. I would like to believe that since the fish vomited Jonah up on dry land, it probably beached itself, which means Jonah probably had a giant fish to cook and could eat for days. But again, I got nothing to go on. That's just what I would have done. So, to the actual text. God appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah's in the fish for three days and three nights. And it says, then Jonah prayed. If you have a pencil and you like to write in your Bible like I do, circle that word then. Because it's very important. Because it points us back to chapter 1. Where Jonah is in the belly of the boat, sleeping. While sailors are freaking out with a storm going on. They urge him to cry out to his God. Mind you, this storm is so bad, it's tearing the ship apart. They urge him to cry out to his God. He doesn't do it. Then it comes about that, oh, this storm is your your fault. He still doesn't cry out to God. Then they throw him overboard into this tumultuous sea. And then we get to his description of what his distress is that causes him to call out to God. Look at verse 2, we'll call it 2a. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. 
Yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. Parallel of verse 3 and verse 5. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought my life up from the pit. What is Jonah describing here? Remember, Jonah's in the whale, in the fish. I'm sorry, fish, the great fish. It's not a whale. If I say that again, somebody run up here and throw something at me. It's not a whale, it's a fish. I give you permission, okay? I got you. You got me, thank you. Jonah is, after all of that, finally crying out to God in the belly of a fish. But he's not crying out to God because he's in the belly of a fish. Matter of fact, this prayer that's recorded is the second prayer of Jonah because the first one is described in 3 through 7. He's sinking down further and further in the water. He's drowning in this tumultuous sea. Look at it. The waters are coming over him. They're surrounding him. The roots and the weeds have wrapped up around his head. He's got no hope. He's drowning. Death is coming And then Jonah wants to pray after what? He sees death around the corner. Then, as if he didn't think death was a possibility while he's on the boat and it's being torn apart. But it says, then I cried out to the Lord out of my distress. His distress is him drowning in the sea. And he says, you heard my voice. As Jonah describes the plight of being thrown into this sea and the water overtaking him, he's being pounded by the waves, he's got no control over his situation, he's facing death, and he finally calls out to God and he's rescued. And then this second prayer that's referencing the first prayer from the belly of the fish is not a prayer of distress, but a prayer of thanksgiving. Jonah's referencing what his circumstance was. Was. But now, he realizes that the fish is not his problem. The fish has rescued him from his problem. He realizes that the fish has been sent as an instrument of God's grace. Let's keep going. Verse 4. It says, then I said, I am driven away from your sight. I love this, right? Who told Jonah to flee from the presence of the Lord? No one but Jonah. Jonah wasn't so much driven away from the presence of the Lord as he did his own driving. He goes to find a way to flee from God's presence. Michael referenced Psalm 139 last week. Oh Lord, where can I flee from your presence? Answer, nowhere. But now Jonah says, God, you've driven me away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. One scholar I read this week said, the alternative to saying to God, thy will be done, which is what Jonah probably should have said, no, not probably should have said, when God first called him, the alternative to saying, thy will be done, is to hear God eventually say to you, your will be done. Because God has allowed Jonah to be taken to the point of death. Jonah has allowed, or God has allowed Jonah to feel utterly rejected by him in order to rescue Jonah and to show his love for Jonah to him. But then we get to verse 7. And here's another funny statement from Jonah. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. Again, it took God allowing Jonah to be taken to the point of death, where everything is out of Jonah's control. Jonah can't save himself. And then, while he's about to die, then he remembers the Lord. He couldn't remember him on the ship when the sailors urged him to cry out to his God, but when he's drowning, about to die, then he 
remembers. I don't really think Jonah remembered so much as he was reminded. And I'll do this. I'll take a poll. Uh, I did it in the first service. Men in the house, you can't hide. I see all of you. When your wife gives you a honey-do list and you forget to do something and then she gets home and reminds you, oh, you should have done this, did you remember or did she remind you? Answer honestly. She reminded you. Jonah is reminded of God's power at this point. And he says, God, out of my distress, he cried out. It's not just a, hey, God, come help me, save me. He's screaming for his life. And better image, he's under the water screaming for his life. Here's the good news. When I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. God rescued Jonah through the fish. His life was ebbing away. He knew he had no hope. And the last thing he did out of his desperation was call upon the Lord. However, when we keep reading, we see that Jonah's confident that it is God who's rescued him and the fact that he'll look upon the temple of the Lord again, which is mentioned twice, by the way. You've got the temple of the Lord in verse 7 and then the parallel, verse 4, look upon your holy temple again. Jonah knows that God's going to restore him. He knows that he's going to rescue and restore him. And it's as if now he's finally realizing that God has allowed him to be in this situation to show his power. He's allowed him to have his experience and he's delivered him from certain death. Now Jonah turns his attention to the real lesson, I think, in verse 8. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Look back to the sailors on the ship. Who were they crying out to? Their gods. Not the God, but their gods. And when they find out who Jonah serves, what do they do? They forsake their vain idols, all of their gods and all of their lots that they were casting, and they cry out to Yahweh, the one true God. Jonah's not referring to them that they have forsaken. They've forsaken their idols. But Jonah's referring, I think, to himself here. Because when Jonah flees from the presence of God, he is forsaking all hope. He is forsaking. God isn't forsaking Jonah. Jonah has turned his back on God and has decided to flee from his very presence. But fleeing from God's presence means Jonah and even us, when we flee God's presence or God's call, we forsake the hope we have in him. But he never forsakes us. Verse 10. Or verse 9, I'm sorry. This is where we see that Jonah's prayer is a prayer of thanksgiving. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will do what? Sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. That's a total 180 from Jonah in chapter 1. I'm not going to flee your presence anymore, God. I surrender, I'm doing what you called me to do. And then I think the best statement in the entire book of Jonah, salvation belongs to the Lord. If you can't see the gospel in the book of Jonah, you might need some new glasses or something. Because there it is. Salvation belongs to the Lord. In verse 10, And the Lord spoke to the fish, And it vomited out upon the dry land, Jonah. And here's how this story relates to us. Here's where we see ourselves in this story. Much like Jonah, we are indeed drowning in a sea. Much like Jonah, we have tried to flee God's presence. Much like Jonah, we have tried to run away from his call. The waves of temptation have battered us down. The weeds of sin have entangled us. But we, just like Jonah, can cry out to the same Lord. 
He doesn't send a fish this time. The early church Christians who were persecuted marked their gathering places with a fish. Do y'all know the sign of the fish, like the ichthus, the stick figure fish? And in that space, they put the letters ichthus, I-C-H-T-H-U or Y-S. And if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 12, before I tell you what that stands for, some of you probably know, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Or really verse 41, I'm sorry. I apologize again. Verse 39. My eyes. Woo. But he answered them. This is Jesus speaking. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented. Spoiler alert. I'm sorry, Michael. Jonah 3 and 4. Spoiler alert. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The fish that the early church Christians who were persecuted marked their meeting areas with, with ichthus, Jesus Christus, theu huia soter. Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. And they used a fish of all things to put that in. Why? Because Jesus is the son of Jonah. You see, just as God sent Jonah, the great fish, to be the instrument of grace to rescue him, he sent Jesus to be the instrument of grace to rescue us. And the truth is that he does that out of his love. And as we heard last week, Michael said that God pursued Jonah and he is pursuing us, that's why he sent Jesus. See, Jonah rebelled against God openly. God had a job for Jonah to do, and he said, no thanks. Guess what, folks? We have done the same thing. Some of you in this room have a call to ministry And it might not be that you're openly rebelling against God. You might just be afraid. Let me tell you something. If God says do it, go do it. Some of you in this room today may not even know Jesus, or you may be battling with belief in God, and he is calling you to salvation, not through my words, but through his holy word. And you're running from it. You're in the sea of sin. Let me tell you that even in Jonah's rebellion, if God pursued him, he's pursuing you in your rebellion. And in your desperation and your circumstance, you can call out to the God of salvation and the second chance. I think that's the main idea from this passage. Is that God is the God of salvation and second chances. He could have easily let Jonah drown in the sea that had taken him deeper and deeper, but he rescued him through the instrument of his grace. And it reminds me, when I read through Jonah, I see a lot of times when I learn this, I learn to read the Bible through the the grand narrative or the storyline of Scripture. You've got creation, fall, or I'm sorry, creation, crisis, rescue, and restoration. And I see that in Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, God gives Jonah a call. Jonah rebels 
and he experiences a great fall. But then God rescues him and he restores him. Much like that today, we serve a God, the same God who created, who has promised to provide a rescuer and he has provided the rescuer in Jesus. Jesus has rescued us and one day he will return because we know that he came, he lived, he died, but he didn't stay dead. Somebody heard that. He rose with all power and victory over sin and death. And one day he will return and restore all things. So are you drowning in a sea of sin today? Call out to the Lord. He will save because he's the God of salvation. The old hymn writers penned these words that I think Jonah would sing at the top of his lungs because he experienced it literally. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the seas heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me. Oh, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. God loves you. God is pursuing you. God has called you. It's time to stop running from him and to start running to him. Don't be like Jonah and be taken to the point of death for you to finally call out upon God. Because I promise you, He is ready and able and willing to save. For those of you believers this morning who have been called and you may be fighting a call because you might feel insufficient for the task or for the work, it's not about your insufficiency. Philip handed me this last service. Woo. It's not about your insufficiency. It's about God's sufficiency. If he called you to a work, he will sustain you. A non-believer, because I know you are here. Cry out to the God of salvation and second chances. He will answer. He will save And to the believer, let this prayer serve as something to spark a fire in your soul of thankfulness to God for saving you. Let's pray together.